Welcome back, everybody. Time for some more Civil War II as we try to push this along. Uh, I'm going to do something right off the bat that I should have done a long time ago, which is remove George McClellan from command. I'm so tired of him not being active, of him kind of going piecemeal, not being able to go into an offensive posture. He's got poor ratings anyway. Uh, so what we're going to do because I don't think we can get McPherson. McPherson uh, eventually did rise to Army Command. In fact, he was the only Union Army commander killed during the entire uh, Civil War. Uh, but he's not there yet. So we're gonna we're gonna send Buell up to take command of this army. Uh, so that'll happen. Uh, move by rail. It's gonna still take 31 days to get there. That's not ideal. So what I might have to do instead. Okay, so I eliminated Buell from Corps Command. We gave him a, a move by rail order. It'll get him there in 12 days. That means next turn I'll be able to remove McClellan from Army Command. We'll replace him with Don Carlos Buell. Much better commander than what I currently have. That should hopefully get the ball rolling on this force. We're still going to try to move Grant's command out of where they are so we can get them refit and in a much better situation. And then we're going to move both of those down this way. I'm trying really hard not to get tunnel vision and only focus on trying to take Richmond because I've got such a massive force in Richmond. And I just really want to finish that off because I feel like if I do, it might kind of move some other things uh, as well. You can see, you know, Sending that huge force down to Richmond had a good effect, and this is something I'm learning as a, this is my first time playing through the full campaign, is that having a massive force threatening his capital city has pulled all of these other scattered forces, for the most part, out of Virginia and freed me up tremendously. So I should have done that from the beginning over here in the West instead of doing a bunch of piecemeal stuff that just got kind of scattered and allowed for him to do the same. If I'd have had a massive Massive force threatening some of his major cities like Memphis and Nashville, it probably would have kept him from doing what he's doing and just making such a frustrating thing for me to deal with. So this is kind of cool. Uh, we've raised Grierson's brigade in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now that may seem strange on the surface uh, until you recognize that most of eastern Tennessee, especially the area around Knoxville, was very pro-Union during the Civil War. So there were a number of Union regiments that were raised in eastern Tennessee. Uh, Knoxville is also the area where Andrew Johnson's from. Now, Andrew Johnson, of course, was a, um, a racist, uh, huge racist, um, very much uh, a white supremacist. Of course, a lot of people were at that time. That doesn't excuse it, but it recognizes it. Um, he was also a U.S. senator who stayed loyal to the Union. So he was a pro-slavery Unionist uh, who um, I guess probably would have been a Whig uh, before the Civil War, uh, before the Whig Party kind of disappeared. The Whigs um, kind of dissolved over the issue uh, over factions. Um, you know, there was a very strong uh, Unionist pro, uh, anti-slavery abolitionist movement, and that was actually the part of the Whigs that ended up kind of uh, forming the Republican Party. But there were other Whigs as well who were pro-Union, but were Southerners, were um, kind of drawn to, there was a third party. And one of the reasons Abraham Lincoln won the election of 1860 was that uh, the Democrats and the Southerners kind of fractured into multiple parties. There were um, there were two, basically two Democrats running. Uh, and there was also the Constitutional Union Party, I think it was called. It was a, it was basically made up of the pro-union um, but also not abolitionist former Whigs. Uh, John Bell was their presidential candidate, and I think Andrew Johnson probably kind of fell into that camp. Uh, the folks who didn't want to abolish slavery but also didn't want to see secession happen. So uh, a lot of that in eastern Tennessee, so that makes sense that we would see this brigade rise up there. We're going to go ahead and start moving them uh, a little closer to the rest of our units. We're actually into early May now. There wasn't a lot of... Uh, of combat that happened on that last turn. Uh, Buell did have a little trouble getting through, though. Uh, he didn't quite make it to where he's going to take command of this army. Uh, we're trying to hang on to Louisville here, but we've been getting harassed by Leonidas Polk's army, uh, which is a pretty substantial force right now, so I'm rushing some reinforcements over there to help with that. All right, so I'm going to lay some telegraph lines all the way along from D.C. down to my forces here in Richmond. Um, we're going to kind of sit in a defensive posture for at least one more turn. 
Uh, well, we might go a little offensive with some of these units, but um, for the most part, we're going to sit tight. We might try to force some combat, but I'm waiting for an opportunity to once again try to assault his works there in Richmond while we continue to assemble. I'm, f I'm assembling a force over here in, um, oh, where was it? Oh, Peoria, Illinois. I've got a number of units coming there. We're going to try to build a, a strike force that can go in and deal with these folks that we've been struggling with over in central Indiana. Let's see if I can move these guys uh, over there as well without any trouble. I don't know. We'll see if we can move through that. I'm not sure we can. Okay, so that looks like Jubal early if I'm recognizing that image right. Uh, so we're, we're making contact with some substantial sized Confederate forces here in Louisville, but it looks like now I've got enough manpower to overcome whatever Leonidas Polk may be trying to throw at me there. All right, so looking over combat for early May, we had a victory in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Don't touch the, uh, the dam there. Um, small defeat here out in uh, Madison, which is uh, southern Indiana. Uh, Granville Dodge up against Sterling Price, uh, Union defeat here. But again, just kind of some minor things happening. Uh, that's up here near Johnstown, where we later won a victory. Erasmus Keys, uh, that's the battle we were looking at there against Jubal Early. Significant uh, victory for me there in terms of the casualties that were caused. And uh, then another one there. So uh, no combat in Virginia at the moment, but I think we're going to go ahead and start pressing that. I'm not seeing where the Confederate force is. It uh, looks like a lot of them are inside, but uh, Robert E. Lee is moving back up. He's crossed the Rapidan. Uh, he's trying to maybe go around our Union forces, but we've still got a substantial uh, number of men in and around D.C., so I'm really not worried about that. Uh, he can have his fun up there all he wants. We're going to try to press this and finish off finish off Richmond if we can. All right, we're back at it around Richmond. This should be a pretty... Oh, there was like nobody there, so <laughs> pretty easy victory. Juba Early is going to get spanked by a pretty significant Union force here in Louisville. Um, we're consolidating our forces more and more and... I think here in the summer of 1863, we're going to be able to make some substantial pushes south. I've got 33,000 men in Louisville. I've got McClellan's army in Posey, Indiana. I've got Grant's army a little further over. Uh, we should be able to really make some inroads on, uh, on the Western theater here in the coming months. We wiped out Jubal Early's force. I'm not sure that anything else is going to happen this time around. Oh, they're hitting my little force here. That was Nathan Bedford Forrest. There's Jubal Early's main army. Now we're going to have a real combat situation here, and it looks like he's got the edge. All right, historically, this is about the time when we had the draft, riot, uh, draft riots, especially in New York. Happened right around the 4th of July. Uh, so we were defeated in that subsequent battle in Louisville. Pretty substantial casualties on both sides. Uh, but we hold the ground, so that's the important thing. Defeated by Nathan Bedford Forrest. That was just the garrison there. That's not a big deal. Uh, nice victory here by Erasmus Keys over Jubal Early. But that was before the subsequent battle that took place there. And Theophilus Holmes, 22,000 men. He lost 73, and then he was like, forget that, I'm out. Um, actually, it was just this battery, apparently, that we were fighting against. That's kind of strange, but um, I'm still waiting for an opportunity to assault these works and finally take out Richmond. It doesn't appear to be happening yet. Robert E. Lee's getting closer to the defenses around Fairfax, so we might want to build them up a little bit. And we've pushed that Confederate force. Looks like he's gone over toward Pittsburgh now. Uh, I guess we're going to have to go ahead and pursue him, although I've got some troops there. That shouldn't be an issue. All right, great news. Don Carlos Buell has finally arrived and can take command of this army. So, General McClellan, we are done with you. So we dismiss that army. We go to Buell to form an army. He takes over the Army of the Tennessee. McClellan is out, as far as I'm concerned. And we push all of these guys into the Army of the Tennessee. Now, hopefully, 
this means we can finally start moving this force and really making something happen. We are very close to where Grant is now. We're moving Grant back here to kind of uh, refit, reform, get ready to go. And uh, he's got Rosecrans along with him. Once Grant gets there, we're going to start pushing south. Actually, I think we'll go ahead and push south now a little bit. Why can't we enter terrain there? Is it because I just... There we go. Oh, I was trying to move too far, I guess. All right, so Buell's not, not apparently ready to start moving. That's fine. He probably needs to be activated first. Okay, up here in Peoria, Illinois, Francis Barlow's got a division uh, that is ready to start. Um, and it looks like the Confederates are pretty much cleared out. They saw what was coming. So uh, we're going to start moving down in and getting this territory reacquired in Illinois. We'll start driving him out of western and southern Illinois. Uh, and we're really in a place now where I think we're going to be able to start making a push. We've, we've dealt with some of the early mistakes that I made. I think we could actually move shields forward down here. And we'll build up around Alexandria, prepare for whatever it is that Lee's up to. Uh, and we'll try to deal with some of these roving bands up here in southeast or southwest Pennsylvania. Okay, so here comes Lee, and he's hitting a a smaller force that might might actually get driven out and it looks like he's got Longstreet along with him. But I've got many more men in DC that I could combine with that force if it comes to it. All right, another big attack coming in Richmond against Theophilus Holmes. 90,000 men against 20,000. We'll see how it goes. Okay. It continues. West Virginia has been admitted to the Union as the 35th state. We were defeated in one battle in the Richmond fortifications. You can see the, uh, you know, I had, what do I got, 130,000 men, and we lost about 17,000 of them. Again, I just, oh, it's so frustrating that we can't seem to finish them off there. Victory in the Battle of Bedford, Pennsylvania. So we're pretty much driven them out of Pennsylvania. We've just got to deal with Fayette uh, here. Here's another defeat. This one, we had 150,000 men total, but we inflicted some pretty serious casualties on him, so I don't know. I don't know what to do here. And then we were defeated at the Battle of the Alexandria Defenses, uh, so now we're going to have to kind of mount up, and I've got to get a core formed out of all these divisions so they're under better command and control and send them back out there to go deal with Lee. Let's look at the scores and objectives. I'm a little concerned about this foreign help number. I don't know how, I, how high it has to get before we face foreign intervention, but obviously uh, that would be a problem uh, primarily because of the British sea power. But you can see the Confederates are almost equal to me in sea power, so I'm going to probably have to refocus a little bit on the naval situation. We've still got a significant advantage on him on combat power as far as the uh, land forces go. His morale is at 120. That concerns me as well. Uh, I don't know if he wins at 185 as well or if that's just my number, but we've got to deal with that. So we're going to start striking blows at the Confederacy, turn that morale number around. So apparently we ended up with another detachment in Knoxville, with which Joe Johnston immediately attacked. I didn't even know they were there. Uh, so they're, they're falling back now. We're going to go get them connected with this Grierson Brigade as quickly as possible. In the meantime, Buell has moved into western Kentucky. And we're still dealing with kind of random Confederates here and there and everywhere. Looks like they've driven part of my force uh, under Erasmus Keys out of Louisville, so we're going to kind of get them moved back over there if we can. Looks like we can do it pretty quickly. Let's see what Grant's doing. Uh, so Grant has crossed over into Paducah, and you can see there's Richard Taylor. Richard Taylor, uh, who was, I think, a lieutenant general in the uh, Confederate Army, was the son of Zachary Taylor, who was president of the United States. Um... All right, so let's see. 
there's that. Uh, speaking of former presidents, uh, I think it was John Tyler, the former president, was actually elected to the Confederate Congress, though I think he died really early in the beginning of the Civil War, so he, I don't know that he ever took his seat. So what I've decided I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the majority of my force here to keep sieging Richmond, but I'm tired of sitting there with a big army doing nothing that's really affecting the, the war. So I'm going to send Crittenden's Corps, which has about a strength of 2,000, to attack uh, this Confederate force uh, under Richard Anderson here. Uh, we're going to send a corps north to help deal with the Lee situation while we simultaneously will bring some folks out of here. Uh, and then we're also moving south elsewhere. So um, looks like Shields has taken Lewis, West Virginia. Uh, we're going to continue that movement. We might go after Braxton Bragg over here in Covington. Uh, but we're just going to keep moving south everywhere we can. Try to put the pressure on the Confederacy a little bit. All right, so it looks like we've hit a force here up in Manassas moving our force north. We also moved... Oh, I guess we didn't cross over. I thought we were sending a unit over here to Enrico, but it didn't happen. Uh, looks like Lee pulled back, though, so that had the desired effect. Lee went north. Is that him there? Heading up into... Or is Lee invading the north in July 1863? Well then. All right, so let's do some things here. We've got to get our um, rail repaired up in Pennsylvania. I think we're going to keep moving these guys. He may be going up there to try to counter my move toward Harper's Ferry, but uh, that's okay. That works out nicely for me. We can move Hamilton's detachment out here. Uh, we're going to pull this core over to that location as well. Looks like we've just got some Confederate irregulars that are kind of trying to harass me there. I'm not too worried about that. Um, all right, so Richmond Fortification is besieged and partially breached. Uh, so there might be our chance. We are down a little bit in terms of our numbers. But hopefully we can get... Oh, McDowell won't assault himself, so we're going to have to send our corps, but our army commander himself won't do it. So we can send three corps in. It's not a substantial amount. That might only be 60,000 men or so, uh, but I guess it's going to have to do. Out west, it looks like Albert Sidney Johnston has the Army of the West, so we're going to send Grant to deal with him. Uh, once again, Confederate forces, Richard Taylor, he's up in Deposey, Indiana. Um, once Francis Barlow deals with Springfield, Illinois, which is hopefully soon here, uh, we can start pressing him south. Cool story about Francis Barlow. Uh, he and, I think it was John Gordon, who was a Confederate general, encountered each other at Gettysburg when Barlow had been severely wounded on the first day of the uh, Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, I, I don't remember the details of the story, but they ended up with a lifelong friendship out of that encounter. And there's just a lot of stories like that. Uh, Barlow was a young guy. I mean, you look at him clean shaven, young, looks like he's right out of West Point. I know he wasn't quite that young, but he still was very young for a division commander. Uh, but it's it's a cool story if you look up the details. Just look up, you know, Google Francis Barlow and John Gordon, and you'll see some of that story. All right, I don't know if that's really going to be it for the assault on Richmond, if that's all the defenders he had left. If so, that would be fantastic. Looks like there's two breaches now. Francis Barlow is assaulting Springfield, Illinois. Never thought that would have to happen, but it is happening. 9,000 men should do the job. We're going to wrap up this episode here uh, when it gets into early August, regardless of what happens. We've retaken Springfield, so that's some good news. I don't know that we've taken Richmond. All right, looks like Grant's taking care of business here in western Kentucky as we are about to start moving into western Tennessee. And this victory over a Confederate force there should help make that a little bit easier. All right, looks like our fight for Harper's Ferry also was going pretty well. So we're going to wrap this up here as soon as we see how everything shook out from that turn. 
Richmond is ours. There it is. It's under the military control of the United States of America. Obviously, that is a big, big deal. Let's go ahead and take a look at the situation. Our morale now 138. We need 185 to win. Uh, Confederate morale is down to 49. They are very close to the danger level of defeat. I don't know what their number needs to be for that to happen. Uh, but obviously, that was really important. We were defeated in Lewisburg, West Virginia. Not a huge deal at this point. Uh, we're just going after, after some more victory points. So, um, Irvin McDowell has taken Richmond and, and looks like Lee has gone north with an unknown number of men. We've got Richard Yule there. So, we'll keep a substantial force to hold Richmond. We'll start sending out some folks to start taking some of these other areas of, of Virginia, but we're going to send the majority of this force north to start cleaning up some of the Confederate Army. Let me know your thoughts about all that. I'm hoping next turn we can win this war, but I'm also a realist and I understand that it may not happen quite that easily. But as the uh, these armies start moving south. Hopefully we put more and more pressure on him. So let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. We'll be back in a couple days with another episode. Thanks for watching.